So I've uh, I arrived in Beirut at 11 a.m. this morning. It's now like 5 or 6 p.m. And uh, it's been quite interesting so far. You know, I've walked around the streets. For hours I was walking around the streets. And um, I, when I first got here, I saw a McDonald's. And I thought, I'm fucking starving. I haven't had anything to eat. I'm going in there. Like, I, I, wanna, I want some Western food. Sometimes you want Western food. So I go in there. And after I paid the cab driver, I paid him like $30. I had $200 left. Um, they, cause they use us and they use Lebanese Lira and I had $200 us left and I walk into the McDonald's and I ordered like a big Mac and whatever. And it came to like 10, 10 us dollars or whatever, which might I add, it does seem like things are cheaper in this country and perhaps some things are, but not everything. Like Macca's cost the same. Once you do the US conversions, like more, I paid over $10. Once you do the convert, that's like $16 Australian. Um, you pay the same thing uh, in, in Australia. So it's not that much cheaper, if at all. Anyways, I go into this McDonald's, I order my stuff and I give her the $100 note, thinking, you know, Mac McDonald's a uh, multinational company and she says, sorry, we only take fives and tens or whatever. And I'm like, are you serious? So, like you're McDonald's. And she's like, yeah. So I had to go, I was walking around the streets for hours looking for an exchange, which the exchanges are everywhere. Looking for an exchange to break down my money so I could get like maybe like five twenties or something or like ideally like, three twenties and, and four tens or whatever. And I went into like 10 different exchanges and one guy told me, you got to go to the Hamra. So I looked on my maps, where's the Hamra? Hamra, it, it's, a, it's meant to be like the, this main central area where a lot of the shops and markets are and stuff. So I looked up on my maps and it was like two Ks away. So I got to walking, I had no choice. It was fucking boiling hot. It was boiling hot. And I'm walking around the streets. I'm like, where is this fuck? Like, give me an exchange, please. All I want is, is, is an exchange. I need an, a money exchange. So I just want to eat. I, I hadn't eaten yet. I had no water on me. I had nothing. And that, the funny thing was, I couldn't get anything. It was like I was walking around and couldn't get access to anything. Like food, water, any services. Like, you, you I couldn't get access to anything with, even though I had like a significant amount of money on me, I had, you know, uh, 200 US dollars on me, plus all the money in my bank, which I can pay on my travel, off my travel card or my credit card or whatever. They have like the, the F POS machines, but no one really wants to accept it. Cause they don't want their money's going into, into the banks here. Cause they don't trust the banks anymore. Anyways, I, I ended up getting it. Um, I found this, I, walk, I was walking through this alleyway in the Humbra and I stopped this lady and I'm like, excuse me, like, uh, where's the Humbra? And she's like, oh, you're, you're sort of in it, but there's more, blah, blah, blah. I said, look, I'm just looking for a money exchange. I just want a, a money exchange. I need to swap dollars. She was really nice. She said, I have a trusted one, go down here, blah, blah, blah. So I followed her instruction. And, um, I, you know what, this might be like a, like a, people would claim this as like a discriminatory thing where I don't, I don't care. I'm going to say it. I trust women so much more than, than I trust men. I don't know why. I think, I, well, I think like, it's pretty obvious why, like who, are the, who, who takes up most spots in prison men who commits most of the crimes men so it's pretty obvious anyways i don't need to go into that i approached her she showed me instructions i went to the like this money exchange and at first the lady was like no i'm not swapping you or the man was like no i'm not swapping you 
So I'm like, fuck. So I walked further down the road. I found another money exchange. There's two guys standing outside of this money exchange smoking cigarettes. And they're kind of looking at me like, what do you want? And I'm looking at them like, I want to get in. <laughs> I want money. And they're like, "How? What, what do you want? How much do you want? And I said, look, I need change for 100. Give me, if you've got change for 100, give me 250s, whatever, I don't care. So he's pulled out some money, given me a, a little bit. And um, yeah, and then I, I walked down to the money exchange with 250s and I got her to break one down and then yeah, like, yeah, it, was a, it was an ordeal. It was an ordeal. But um, I got it done and then I went to Macca's and I was sitting in Macca's for like an hour and a half in the aircon waiting to check in to my hotel. That was pretty good. Macca's was pretty good. It was nice in there. People were on their laptops working so I didn't feel too guilty for kind of mooching off the, the aircon and the Wi-Fi. Um, and then, yeah, I started walking the streets. Um, and the streets are pretty interesting. Now, I said in a recent, like I was, as I was walking the streets, I wanted to figure out like, obviously there's a money problem here. And that, that goes back to the banking crisis thing. So I wanted to know a bit more about this banking crisis, you know, what, like, what are the origins? What's the cause? Like what actually happened? And I dug a little bit further into it and um, I actually I got, after I couldn't find anything really good on Google, I went on ChatGPT and I, I just asked ChatGPT to explain everything like in depth, put it into like a nice format. Um, so that's one thing, Google is being replaced by these AI technologies because Google, Google's like, when you compare it to ChatGPT, to the answers ChatGPT, Google's fucking shit. Like, I wanted to know about the banking crisis and it just gave me like all the bunch of like articles that I had to kind of like sift through and stuff. And I'm like, uh, I don't, I don't like, it just wasn't efficient. And I, I'm like, I'm reading, I read a good Reuters article actually, that was probably the best one I could find, but all of the other ones, like they didn't give me what I wanted to know, the information that I wanted to know. So I just, I'm like, oh wait, chat GPT. I go, I go on that and it gives me a full rundown of, of what's happened. So from my understanding, from my understanding, some of the origins of this banking crisis in Lebanon is, um, well, for one, they, they had like a pretty unsustainable kind of system going on. I mean, this, the economy, it was heavily reliant on foreign in investment and foreign depositors bringing money in and even like expats, Lebanese expats who were working overseas, making better money and then bringing that money back into the country. The, the economy was heavily reliant on that plus like other, other things like tourism and stuff. So it's heavily reliant on like overseas money being brought into the economy. And that over-reliance was, it, it, well, it proved to be unsustainable. The other thing was like the political stuff here. So the leaders are, are, are elected uh, as per their religious affiliation. So you've got like a, I think it's the Christian who is the, the top, and then you've got the, the Sunni and the Shia Muslim um, who are kind of second and third place. I think that's how it goes. Or And, and they may trade positions um, where like a, Sh a Shia might go in first place. I, I'm not exactly sure, but I, I know it, you're selected by political affiliation and there must be one leader from each uh, religion, um, so Christianity, and then two Muslim, one Shia, one Sunni. So that was that political system proved that model proved to be like pretty inefficient in terms of like decision making and all that kind of stuff. It was really like uh, like gridlocked a lot of decision making, and it wasn't efficient at all. And I can imagine why because. If you have that, if you have like that, that structure where you've got the, 
the the Islamic leaders and then you've got the Christian leaders, they're always going to butt heads um, because ideologically it's different. They're both different. Muslim and Christians are, are both different, like ideologically. And, you know, as, we, as they say, they say uh, politics is downstream from culture. Well, I've added to that that culture is downstream from religion. So the way you're going to run, the way you want your culture and your political system to be organised is going to depend on what religious background you come from, what religious affiliation, because that really influences the way you want your culture to be shaped and your politics to, to, to operate within. Um, I, I think, yeah, I think politics and culture is both downstream from religion. So you have that, you have that, that inefficient political system that caused a lot of division and really gridlock decision making. And, you know, and a couple of other things like uh, regional conflicts, like regional conflicts, like we're in the Middle East here and the Middle East has been there's been conflict for decades. Like, we all know that there's been conflict for decades. It's run decades long. And the most significant conflict recently, recent times, for Lebanon, that, that affected Lebanon, I mean, they, they probably all affected Lebanon to some extent, but the, the one that's really, really rocked the boat for the Lebanese economy and, and Lebanese society is the, the Syrian civil war, which went on for years. And the result of that war was, was like a, an influx of millions of Syrian refugees. I mean, the Lebanese population doubled overnight because of Syria and in, the influx of Syrian refugees. So we have like those three factors, like the, the inefficient political system, the regional conflict, and then all these external factors um, like the like the, the lack of uh, the lack of funds overseas funds and foreign investment coming through now some of the causes you know this is this is the origins of it this is these these are the factors that that kind of made lebanon the, the economy so so susceptible to you know what has caused this economic this banking crisis in the first place you know you can imagine with a political system such as this one and then you know you have regional conflict you have poverty you have all these things it's a breeding ground for corruption and that's exactly what went on in with these banks there was corruption the the banks were engaging in like financial engineering um, pretty much creating a Ponzi scheme. The elites, the Lebanese elite were embezzling money from the banks and engaging in like illicit financial activity. And that was one of the factors that, that led to this crisis. Among other things, it's multifaceted. Um, I mentioned earlier that there was a lack of foreign inflow of money coming in, which Lebanon, uh, in the past has been really, really reliant on. I mean, I forgot to mention that the, the inflow of overseas funds into America, whether that's from expats, you know, bringing money in or tourism or foreign investment, this has been a huge source of government spending for, for Lebanon. And so because that, because that inflow of overseas funds began to decrease, the banks wanted to attract more foreign investment so they started offering these ridiculous interest rates to attract more foreign investment and more foreign deposit deposited money into the country and it proved to be like these interest rates would be i don't know exactly off the top of my head the exact rates but um they were unsustainable and it's led to you know a huge crash you know they couldn't they couldn't manage the, that you know the those conditions and the the banks couldn't manage the the monetary policy correctly the country began to be in like enormous debt like one of the worst debt to gdp ratios in the world and 
and you just had all these factors um, that that came into play. Uh, you know, the, the bad debt, really bad debt, and then you have the corruption going on with the elites and the and the banks, and then probably politicians as well who are playing their role. And then you had, you know, the, the poor, poorly managed monetary policy by the banks and the debt was just spiraling out of control and then it all collapsed. And then, and so the impact of some of this is, well, you've had a lot of social unrest. There's been massive protests here. I don't know when exactly, I, it, I think it was a couple of years ago, there was a massive protest. People were like walking into the banks and like breaking into banks. There's this one lady, I heard a, a story recently of this one lady, her sister, if I'm not mistaken, had can has cancer and couldn't get treatment because that's one thing that's going on here. People can't even access like basic necessities like healthcare or food and, and fuel for that matter. Um, and her sister, this lady's sister had a, she had, uh, she had cancer and she needed treatment. She couldn't get access to treatment because the, the pharmaceutical supply is really bad here. Like I sent my grandmother before I left, put like a whole stack of Panadols in my luggage case just to give to some of my family members here because they they could, they can't, the, the, the supply of pharmaceuticals is like really low, really bad. And I can't imagine, you know, if you, if you're on like, say, antidepressants, right, you can't, and you're like, because you're depressed or whatever, you're not, you can't di just discontinue your antidepressants just suddenly, right, because that, that's a huge risk of suicide, huge risk of suicide. I've heard of many stories of people who just discontinued their antidepressant prescriptions and they... They're like, well, that was one of the worst things I ever did. So imagine you're here, you're a citizen here, you're taking antidepressants and you go to the pharmacy to get your next round and they tell you, oh, we don't have them and you can't find them anywhere. Huge risk of suicide, really bad, really, really bad. Anyways, this lady, she, um, her sister had cancer, couldn't get access to the to treatment or whatever. And so she's gone to, she's gone to the bank and she said, look, I have money in the bank. I need to, I need to get it out um, because my sister needs treatment. I need, like, I need to pay for her treatment. And the banks, and like another impact of this was the banks freezing everyone's account and not, not allowing people to get their money out. So this lady has gone there and asked for her money to, to come out even though it's been like the, the, the value of what she had in her savings account has been like largely significantly eroded um, due to like this hyperinflation, like massive inflation, massive devaluation of the currency. Like she's gone in there and asked uh, whatever I have left in there because like she could have had like, I've heard people have had like 50K in there and now it's worth 5K because of the currency devaluation. Um, and she's gone in there and said, give me whatever I have left in there. I need it for my sister for treatment. They said, no, we can't give it to you. We, we, we've run out of money ourselves. We can't give any money out. So she's gone back with a gun. I'm not sure what, she, I don't know, like a pistol or whatever. She's gone back with a gun and she's held the whole bank up. And she's like, give me my fucking money. I want my money out. And she's holding the bank up. She, she, just a regular lady and you can understand like the desperation like I, I I don't hear anyone here who speaks about that story speak about it in a negative light like it's a it's more of like a not a, not an inspirational story or anything like that but it's like this kind of story is a testament to, to to what's going on here like people are really really doing it tough people have sick family members People like and can't get access to pharmaceuticals. People will have lost like entire savings due to the devaluation of the currency, and they can't even access what they have left. There's all this social unrest, and you know, a lady, just a regular woman, going and holding up a bank, 
is a testament to like all this shit going on. It's it's just it's just crazy. It's crazy. And so one of the problems is now is you have all these like talented uh, and really educated people who are highly skilled people who are emigrating, they're leaving the country. They're like, oh, there's, there's nothing for me here. I've got to get up and leave and look for op better opportunities abroad. And you, it, like, it's understandable. Like if you're an educated person and you've spent all that effort and time and money on getting educated and you have, you know, you're, you're, you're lucky in a way, you consider yourself lucky. Why would you stay here with all the stuff going on? Like why, when your skills and your education, your talent can be of better use uh, somewhere overseas where it's more stable, like conditions are more stable, social conditions are more stable, political conditions are more stable, economic conditions are more stable. So they get, like there's a whole swath of talented, educated people who are just getting up and leaving, looking for opportunities abroad. And what that's doing that's further weakening the Lebanese, like the, the economy's capacity to, to recover. So it's just like a, it's just like an ongoing cycle. And not to mention like the, it's already like pretty, it's pretty unequal society, like economically, um, but the gaps just like the, the inequality gaps, like further increase, like the, like the difference between the rich and the poor is just like widening significantly. Like you see, you see guys in like Lamborghinis and then you see guys like on the street, like anyways, the, the, in, the, the gap of inequality is just like really bad. Seems like there's no middle class. There probably is, but you know, that the gap, again, the gap between the wealthy and the middle class and the poor would just be like, it'd be, incomprehensible and so due to the inequality you're going to get like more poverty so there's a humanitarian crisis going on there's poverty and you know you can see it i i think a lot of the poverty is coming from the a lot of the syrian refugees that you see here i've had so many of the like these young kids like that like not with any adults there's no adults in sight and these young kids are just following me around asking for money and I don't give any to them I will I did one I did once today to a mother it was an adult with a with a kid I gave her a couple of dollars um, but I'm not doing that again because they like there are these little kids Syrian kids who've obviously been displaced as refugees they've been displaced from their parents or whatever and now they're being human trafficked but there's probably some guy watching them from afar and he gets them to go out and beg for money and then he gets a, a cut from what they earn. Um, so yeah, I, 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 when I was sitting at McDonald's, I, there were these two Syrian kids who were sitting outside the window. I could see and they're like tapping the window and they're asking for shit and one of them pointed to the water i had a full bottle of water and i got up and gave that to them and then he asked me for something else probably money after that i couldn't understand what he was saying but i said that's it take it go i'm happy to give water and food like water if, like if i had a, a kid come up to me this is how this happened in cambodia as well many times because the same shit happens in cambodia as well like you got 10 year old kids at midnight like seriously at midnight I, I remember one night I, in Cambodia in Siem Reap I'm going I was hungry and I went to go and get some some food from a from a street food whatever and I'm sitting down it was like a foe and I'm sitting down this little 10 year old kid dirt on the face whatever he comes up to me midnight this is around midnight should be in bed he comes up to me and he's like oh blah 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 saying something and I said to him, no, I'll, I, I'll get you food, but I'm not giving you money. Because I know these kids, they got some, someone watching them from afar. And these, these adults are telling them, making them work. Uh, it's, it's a form of child labor and human trafficking. 
They make them go around and ask for money and then those kids have to go back and give the adults the money. Um, so it happens, happens, you know, it's, it's quite a common thing. I didn't know it would happen in Lebanon here, but it's, uh, yeah, it's quite a common thing. I'm, I'm aware of it from Asia. Anyways, this kid, he comes up to me and he's, he's asking for money. I said, no, I'll buy you food, no money. And he said, yeah, he agreed. So we're sitting there at midnight. I heard this 10 year old kid doesn't speak a lick of English. He's sitting there, he's got dirt all over his face, he's dirty, he looks homeless. And we're eating together. But yeah, the same thing, you get the same thing here and it's the Syrians. And um, yeah, it, it's pretty sad. It's pretty sad because like a lot of these Syrians have obviously been displaced. Um, and probably many of the kids have been displaced from their from their parents. Who knows what's happened to their parents? And you got these kids like fending for themselves on the streets. Like it's it's pretty full on. And these kids are young. They're like some of them are as young as some under ten, under ten years old. Some of them. It's 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 yeah. It's it's pretty sad. Um, but. You, yeah, you, you can't give them money because they, they beg for money and they follow you around, some of them. If you're not stern with them, they'll keep following you around. If you engage too much with them, I don't, I don't, I don't engage too much with them now. Um, but yeah, and, and they're, they're, obviously, they're obviously being trafficked or something or uh, who knows, who knows. Child labour, they're being used by adults to go and beg for money. And it's, it's, it's a sm like, I'm not going to say it's smart, but it's a strategic thing, right? If you're a trafficker, you get, you want children to work for you because children are more likely to, um, gain the sympathy from people with money. Like if you see a kid who's asking for money and they look kind of homeless and they're hungry and that you're going to be like, fuck, it's a kid. Like I've got to help a kid. Like it's a a defenseless kind of a defenseless kid i got to help it out it's, it's she, he or she has no parents no money blah 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 so it's a strategic thing um but yeah it's just something to avoid and it's, it's a really sad thing that's that's you know that's a testament to the humanitarian crisis that's going on here at the moment and it's um yeah it's it's a pretty uh pretty rough time here for for lebanon um, I, you know, I heard many stories before coming, before coming here, I, but you know, and, and I, I walked the streets and today and, you know, I felt like the impact of payments and, you know, bank payments and money transfers and all that. And I'm like, you know, I need to dig a bit deeper into this banking crisis because like I can f kind of feel the effects in some sense. Um, and I can see things playing out in front of me, you know, like poverty and stuff like that and people struggling. And I'm like, I need, I need to research a bit more into this. And, and so I did, and that's what this video was for. And um, yeah, I hope to make a few more about this. I'm having fun doing this, uh, this travel journalism kind of thing.